Now, now maybe you're hearing that we are entering into this season of Holy Week, and you're like, man, what, what the heck is that? Like, that, I saw the sign out there, but, but what exactly is it that we are talking about? What, what is this Holy Week? Well, this is a season that Christians for about 1,500 years have celebrated in which they commemorate the events of the final week of Jesus' life. It begins with Palm Sunday, as Darnisha said during worship, Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, his final entry into Jerusalem, the one that would culminate in his death. That's what we'll be spending our time thinking about today, and it moves from that to Monday, Thursday, the, the night when the Lord Jesus was betrayed after he had broken bread with his disciples in the Last Supper. It moves from Monday, Thursday to Good Friday, which we'll be celebrating together as a church here in this room and then in our mask-only service. That's where we commemorate Jesus' death, and it moves from Good Friday to Easter Sunday, where we celebrate the most important thing that has ever happened, that Jesus triumphed over the dead. This is an ancient practice. It developed pretty early in church history, and, and it kind of just happened. There was no formal declaration. There was no like, hey, this week we've officially designated as Holy Week. It actually began sometime after the time of Constantine. Christians would make pilgrimages back to the Holy Land on the week leading up to Easter. And and almost as kind of like an amusement park thing, they would try to visit the sites of these events leading up to Easter. And so they would walk down the Mount of Olives on Palm Sunday to remember Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. And, and the ministers there would lead the people who had gathered in prayers. And then they would go to what they believed was the site of the upper room for Monday Thursday. And they would reflect on the fact that all of us have betrayed Jesus by our sins, not just Judas. And then they would go to where they thought the crucifixion had happened on the hill outside of Jerusalem. And they would spend time there mourning and wailing. We have these accounts from the early church that people would weep all night as they reflected on the death of their Lord. And then Christians would go to the tomb, the, the, the believed site of the garden tomb, and they would reflect and celebrate Jesus' triumph over death. And over the years, it just became kind of a formal thing. I don't know if you've got traditions like that in your family. I know for us, the tradition sort of emerged around Christmas. It started when we were little kids, my brother and I. I couldn't go to sleep because I was so excited about Christmas. And so as a result, I would, I would get up and go to my parents' room every hour on the hour and go, can we open presents yet? And they would say, no. <laughs> and eventually they would cave around 5 or 6 a.m., because they were tired of being woken up. And so we would go and we would open presents. And without saying it, it just became our tradition that we open presents at like 5 or 6 a.m. We didn't plan it that way. It just sort of happened. And this is kind of how things went with Holy Week. Christians just did this for years and years and years, and it became this official practice. But the emphasis on the final week of Jesus' life is a, a really biblical one. Some, some scholars estimate that nearly a third of the Gospels are spent just telling the story of Jesus' final week. It's not that the whole story of Jesus isn't important. It's all profound. It's all significant. It all means something for us and what it means to honor him with our lives. But there are some profound and unique truths that this week has to teach us. And I trust that the Lord will teach us as we make this journey together. But this journey begins with Palm Sunday, which is what we're celebrating today. So let's dive right in. If you've got a Bible, do me a favor, turn in it to the gospel according to Luke. We'll be in chapter 19, verses 28 through 40. And and to set a little bit of context, what's taking place in Luke 19 is is really the culmination of about a 10-chapter story arc in Luke's gospel. Uh, You see, in in Luke chapter 9, he makes this comment towards the end. I think it's verse 51 or 52. And Luke says, Jesus set his face towards Jerusalem. It's as if Jesus sort of turns his vision and he says, this is where I'm going. And and everything that follows for the next 10 chapters is Jesus' journey towards Jerusalem. There's a sense in which he's always been on his way to Jerusalem. Throughout the entirety of his public ministry, even just a couple of verses before the one I mentioned in Luke 9, Jesus says, hey, I am going to die. 
Like I, I, I am, I am, I've come into the world to seek and save that which was lost and this is going to lead to my death at the hands of the high priests. But, but the thing is Jesus had spent a lot of time talking in riddles and in metaphors and in parables and so the disciples generally assumed this was just another one of those. And so every time Jesus said that, they thought he can't really mean that but this is one of those cases where no, Jesus really meant it. His whole life has been lived in the shadow of the cross. And in chapter 9, he begins the journey that will lead to his death. Now, there's some stops along the way. It's, it's not as though Jesus runs as fast as he can towards Jerusalem. He, he still takes time to teach us how to pray. We get the Lord's Prayer a little bit later in Luke. He still takes time to perform miracles and, and communicate parables, but everything is done with the end in mind. This past week, my wife and I were in Dallas, Texas to uh, officiate the wedding of some, some dear friends of ours, people that we had done premarital counseling with. Uh, and Mickey had never been to Texas before, and I hadn't been in five or six years. And so we made some plans because we had gotten in a couple days early just to make sure we had time to get situated. We made plans to, to visit a couple things. Like, uh, I, I knew that Mickey had never had Whataburger before, which is Texas's contribution to the fast food game. And it's a pretty good contribution. Like, if I'm being real, I think Whataburger is the best thing in Texas, which might have just lost half the room. But I, I, I think Whataburger's awesome. Um, and so I said, okay, if we're in Texas, we've got to go to Whataburger. Uh, Mickey is a huge fan of Chip and Joanna Gaines and Magnolia and all this stuff. It seems a little culty, but, you know, people are stoked on it. And, and the thing is, they have their, like, amusement park uh, home goods place in Waco, like an hour away from us. So we said, okay, well, let's stop by there. Let's, let's take a look. We had all these plans, but we knew that the reason we were there was for that wedding. We knew that that was our purpose in Texas. And so there were other things we did, and there were other places we went, but that wedding was always in the back of our minds. This is where it's going. This is why we're here. So it is with the cross in Jesus. Everything he does, he does in the shadow of the cross. And at long last, in our passage, after these 10 chapters of Jesus setting his face towards Jerusalem, he gets there. And we get to chapter 19, verse 28. When Jesus had said these things, he went on ahead, going up to Jerusalem. And when he drew near to Bethphage and Bethany, at the mount that is called Olivet, he sent two of his disciples saying, go into the village in front of you, where on entering you will find a colt tied on which no one has ever yet sat. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? You shall say this, the Lord has need of it. So those who were sent went away and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners said to them, why are you untying the colt? And they said, the Lord has need of it. And they brought it to Jesus. And throwing their cloaks on the colt, they set Jesus on it. And as he rode along, they spread their cloaks on the road. As he was drawing near, already down the Mount of Olives, the whole multitude of his disciples began to rejoice and praise God with a loud voice for all the mighty works that they had seen, saying, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. So Jesus reaches the end of his journey towards Jerusalem. And we're told that he stops in these sort of twin cities of Bethany and Bethphage. And we don't know as much about Bethphage as we do Bethany. But what we know is that both of the cities are kind of like suburbs of Jerusalem. They're a mile or two outside of the city itself. And so not to put it too crudely, but what, what you can kind of imagine if you want to update this in modern terms is that Jesus stops in Brandon and he takes 60 into downtown Tampa. This is essentially what's happening, is he stopped in this suburb to get ready for his entrance into the city itself. But in order to do this, he commandeers a ride. He sends the disciples to the neighboring city and says, you're going to find a cult tied up, take it. And if anyone stops you, say, the Lord needs it. Wouldn't it be great if this is how shopping worked, right? <laughs> that you could just... The Lord needs it, and you can get whatever you want. 
This has led to a lot of debate. What's actually going on here? Some people have, have suggested that maybe that Jesus had worked something out ahead of time with the owners of this animal. Uh, maybe he'd sent word ahead of time. He had friends in Bethany. Maybe they had communicated that, that Jesus was going to need this animal to sort of stage his entrance into Jerusalem. That's certainly a possibility. Another theory that's kind of been put forward that I, I find compelling is that it was understood in this day that kings didn't need to walk anywhere and they had sort of like immediate rights to any property that would prevent that. So all a king had to do was say, give me your horse. And it was understood that the horse belongs to the king. We have something like this today. If you've ever watched like, like a true crime movie and there's a police chase, the, the police officer can just go up to any taxi driver and go, give me your car. I'm in the middle of something. I need it. And so that might be a possibility as well. But ultimately, we don't know. We don't know how this worked out. We just know that what Jesus told the disciples to say worked. And they give him this donkey, which he rides into the city. But it's important to recognize that this whole event that we celebrate on Palm Sunday, that we call the triumphal entry, Jesus wasn't the first person to do this. This had happened before. Justo Gonzalez is a Methodist theologian, and, and he describes the situation like this. He says, triumphal entries were common enough to be recognized by early readers of the Gospels, but they were rare enough to retain their sense of the extraordinary. Since time immemorial, conquerors claiming a city would enter it in a procession. Kings were celebrated with a triumphus, a solemn procession where the victor exhibited the spoils of war surrounded by the leaders of his armies, as well as conquered kings and rulers and numerous captives destined to slavery. The victor, wearing a crown of laurel, would ride on a chariot pulled by white horses, white being the color of victory, and would finally go to the temple of Jupiter to offer sacrifices. This was a scene that people had seen before. It was familiar to them. I still remember the, the first time the Tampa Bay Buccaneers won the Super Bowl. I was in the seventh grade, and I watched the, the entire game. It was like one of the only football games I watched. I watched it all from my parents' living room. And I remember as soon as the clock hit zero and we actually won a Super Bowl, I, I ran out into the driveway and I could hear everybody cheering. I could hear hor horns being honked. I could hear fireworks going off. I don't know where anybody got fireworks in February. And then I remember a couple days later, my, my aunt and my uncle took me and my brother and my cousins downtown, and we watched the parade as, as the Buccaneers entered into the city to celebrate their victory. And this was a very different team, right? This was the team of Mike Allstott and Martine Gramatica and Warren Sapp. But I remember it. And ironically enough, when the Buccaneers once again won the Super Bowl, thanks to the grace of our Lord and Tom Brady... <laughs> I was sitting in the exact same living room. I walked outside with my wife, which was not a thing back in seventh grade. And we drove through the city and we heard people cheering. It was the same thing. There were some slight differences. The parade was down the river. People were wearing masks. But, but it was this thing that, that we were familiar with. It didn't happen often, but I'd seen it before. I knew what it was. It's the same thing with Jesus' entry into Jerusalem. This was something that would have triggered deja vu for the people who saw it. And they probably would have thought of a very specific triumphal entry, one that had taken place about 350 years before the time of Jesus. There was a military leader named Alexander the Great. Maybe you remember him from history class. And he had asked Jerusalem for assistance, and Jerusalem had refused it. And so after he had finished his campaign, he made his way to Jerusalem. And, and, and the leaders of Jerusalem were terrified that he was going to destroy the city out of retribution for them not helping him in his campaign. And so they organized a triumphal procession for Alexander the Great. He rode in on his white war horse. The crowds cheered him on the outskirts of town. He even came into the city to the temple and offered sacrifices to Yahweh. The crowds were probably excited because he wasn't wiping them out. But this was one of the last ones that had taken place in Jerusalem. And so when they see Jesus doing this, they go, hey, that's that thing that I heard about. This is that thing that kings do. 
Like, make no mistake, it is obvious for everybody watching when Jesus does this, he is setting himself up as the rightful king of Jerusalem. He's saying, I am king. This is what conquering kings do, and I am a king. But there's a difference between what normally happened and what Jesus does. Normally, kings would ride in on war horses. They would ride in on white, thoroughbred steeds. But Jesus doesn't do that. Jesus rides in on the colt of a donkey. And this is intentional. Jesus is directly fulfilling the words of Zechariah, chapter 9, verses 9 through 10. The prophet Zechariah says this, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. I will cut off the chariot of Ephraim, the war horse from Jerusalem. The battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall speak peace to the nations. He shall rule from sea to sea, from river, from the river to the ends of the earth. Jesus is doing here what the promised Messiah would do. He's doing what the promised king of Israel would do. But notice, rather than riding in on on a white horse, which happens in Revelation, here in this triumphal entry of Jesus, he is riding in on a donkey as a symbol of humility. He's riding in as a symbol of peace. That's, That's what Zechariah says the king will do. That he will come and he will speak peace to the nations. And that's what Jesus has come to do. He comes to show that his rule is not just about the borders of Israel. It extends beyond. He has not just come to bring salvation for the people of Jerusalem, but among all peoples. And then, as if to confirm this, Jesus goes to the temple. You'll read about that in your devotional on Monday. And he starts flipping tables. And what does he say? The Gospels say that as he drove out the money changers, he said, my father's house should be a house of prayer for the nations. It should be a house of prayer for the nations. Palm Sunday tells us that one of the central components of Jesus' ministry is the reconciliation of people groups who were once divided. And as I reflect on the last year and consider some of the long overdue conversations our nation has had around issues of racial justice, it it strikes me that sometimes people can can view that whole conversation as being a purely political issue. But but Baylife, brothers and sisters, hear me. Conversations about reconciliation and justice and human dignity and the sin of racism, it's not political for us. It's a Palm Sunday issue. Jesus rides into Jerusalem to bring peace to the nations, to reconcile what has been torn apart. This is about the church truly living in light of the reality that her king has ushered in when he entered Jerusalem on a donkey to bring justice, to bring unity, to bring wholeness, to reconcile what sin has torn apart. And make no mistake, Jesus is setting himself up as king. This is what our king calls us to And yet he's not like the other kings that people are familiar with. He's not like Alexander the Great. He's a different sort of king. Everybody watching realizes that Jesus is claiming to be king. That's what the disciples say in verse 38. They cry out, blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. And he answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Why did the Pharisees want the disciples to shut up? Well, they actually probably have sort of a reasonable impulse there. Because here's what we know from history. Anytime somebody set themselves up as a king, Rome crushed that with unbelievable violence. The Roman Empire maintained peace through force. They called it the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And so when Jesus rides into Jerusalem doing what kings do, and all of his disciples say, this man is a king, the religious leaders go, that's going to get us in trouble. That's not going to go so well for us. That's not going to keep the peace. And to be fair, they're not wrong. There have been numerous uprisings throughout Roman history, and Rome always came down like a sledgehammer. 
But the sort of peace they want is not the sort of peace that Jesus has come to bring. It's as if they say, you know, it's great that you're riding on a donkey. It's great that you're here to bring peace. Why don't you start by shutting these people up? Because they're causing a commotion. The the religious leaders want Jesus to bring peace, but they want him to do it at the expense of truth. Did you catch that? The disciples are saying something true about who Jesus is, but that's causing a stir. And so they go, no, we don't want the peace you're bringing. We want the sort of peace that comes when nobody says anything that rocks the boat. So tell your disciples to shut up. And truth be told, this is the sort of peace that our culture tends to be comfortable with. It's fine if you believe what you believe as long as you don't believe it enough to think that it's true and other people are wrong. Then we can have peace. You know, I I can't help but think of a bumper sticker that's become really popular in the last 10 to 15 years. Um, You'll probably see it on your way home from church. Uh, It says, coexist. And it's it's a blue bumper sticker in white letters. And the the letters are essentially the the symbols of many of the world's great faiths. And, And let me just be abundantly clear. Like, the basic idea captured there, I'm, I'm all for. I think religious freedom is important, not just for Christians, but for Muslims and Wiccans and Hindus and all other faiths. I think religious violence is a terrible thing. I mourn the hostility that comes as a result of religious disagreement. I'm all for working together towards living in harmony and the common good and flourishing of our society. But what I've found, especially when I talk to friends who have that bumper sticker, what I found that they actually mean by it is something to the effect of stop saying that you're right and nobody else is. Stop, stop saying that your way is the only way. Just acknowledge that you're all right and we can all get along. That's normally what's captured behind that sentiment. Not always, but that's what I've found. That's peace at the expense of truth. That's not what Jesus has come to bring. The, the gospel makes radical claims. Jesus claims to be the only way to the Father. And we can't sand down those harsh edges in the name of not having hard conversations. We can't stop saying Jesus is king just so it won't rock the boat. That doesn't mean we have to be harsh about the truth. That doesn't mean we have to be aggressive or confrontational. We can communicate the truth gracefully. But it is to say that sometimes, while we're not harsh about the truth, the truth is, in fact, harsh. The Pharisees want Jesus to bring peace at the expense of truth. But he tells them, if I tell my disciples to stop crying out, the very rocks would do it. It's as if he says, all creation knows that I'm king, not just the people who've been traveling with me. But the disciples don't quite understand Jesus either, if we're being honest. The disciples are crying out, this this is the king, and and they're celebrating the mighty works that he's done, but they don't really understand what it means to be for Jesus to be king any more than the Pharisees do. And I think we can fall into the disciples' error just as easily. And, And you see this most clearly when you go a little bit further in Luke's gospel to the events of Maundy Thursday, the night when Jesus is betrayed. In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is betrayed, Judas arrives, he greets him with a kiss as if to say, this is the one who you should take into custody. And we're told that when those who were around Jesus saw what would follow, they said, Lord, shall we strike with the sword? And one of them, who we know from the Gospels is Peter, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his right ear, and Jesus said, no more of this. I think it's Matthew who tells us that Jesus said, those who live by the sword die by the sword. Put your sword away, Peter. And he touched his ear and he healed him. You see, in spite of the fact that the disciples are right about the fact that Jesus is king, they still don't understand what sort of a king he is. They're still expecting him to take his kingdom by force. They're still expecting him to draw swords on Rome. They're still expecting a political revolution. They think that Jesus is the exact same sort of king as Alexander the Great. They think that he plays by the same rules that the world plays by. They think he is no different 
than the man of violence who rode in Jerusalem all those centuries prior. But the minute that somebody draws a sword in Jesus' name, he tells them, put it away. Put it away. Because Jesus will claim his kingdom not by drawing a sword, but by being subjected to the sword. The, the, the Christ who rides in on the white steed with the, the sword is the Christ of Revelation, but the Christ of now, it's the same Jesus, but Jesus has not come in his first coming to bring violence, but to be subjected to it. I can't think, I can't help but think back to a few months ago watching the news in horror as our nation's capital was battered by people carrying crosses and blaring worship music. How different that is from the king who says to Peter, put your sword away. The Pharisees want peace at the expense of truth. The disciples want peace through violence. And if we're being honest, both of these temptations exist in our hearts. I find that line running down my heart. There are those of us who would gladly sand off the rough edges of the gospel if it would just keep the peace. We'll go against what the Bible teaches about sexuality or the exclusivity of Christ or the reality of God's wrath as long as everybody just gets along. But Jesus calls himself the truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And we, if we follow him as king, must be truthful even when it's costly. There are others who would ignore the commands of Christ to love our enemies and pray for those who persecute us because let's just be honest, that's really hard. That's not natural. We want conflict because we love it and we thrive on it. We treat Jesus as though he is no different than Alexander the Great. And yet Jesus is telling us to put down our sword and pick up our cross just like he did to Peter all those years ago. If Palm Sunday shows us anything, it's that the king that rode into Jerusalem is not the sort of king that any of us would expect. Just think back to the differences between Jesus and Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great arrives on a white horse, and Jesus rides in on a donkey. Alexander the Great rides in as a crowd celebrates him, and Jesus certainly gets that at the beginning, but if you go even three verses past where we just left off, Jesus enters the city of Jerusalem weeping. Alexander the Great goes to the temple and offers sacrifices. Jesus goes to the temple and flips the tables. Kings when they entered cities, would receive a crown made of branches wrapped together. Jesus receives a crown of thorns. Kings would enter the city and be clothed in purple, and the same thing happens to the Lord Jesus, except that purple garment that the Roman soldiers place on him is stained with his blood because he is bearing the weight of our sins. Kings would enter the city and they would be seated on their throne. Jesus enters Jerusalem and he is hung from a cross. He's not the king that we expected, but hear me, he is the king that we desperately need. He is the king we desperately need because from that cross, he will conquer his enemies. He will break the chains of sin. He will shatter the power of Satan. He will disarm the rulers and the authorities of this world. He will set his people free. The crowds cry out, in Matthew and Mark, Hosanna. And that's a, that's a phrase that you've probably heard in countless worship songs, but I don't know if you know this or not. The, the literal rendering of Hosanna is, save us now. You say, here comes the king, save us now. And that's exactly what he's come to do. That's exactly what he's come to do. But his salvation will come through a cross. I would venture to say that in this room, There are a few different kinds of people. There's those of us who haven't bent the knee to Jesus. Maybe you've been hovering around church for a while. Maybe you've been dragged here by a friend, family member, spouse, parent, boyfriend, girlfriend, who you shouldn't be dating. (laughs) My prayer for you is that today would be the day that you acknowledge that Jesus is king that you acknowledge what even the rocks beneath your feet know. What even the rocks would cry out if God's people were silent, that Jesus is Lord over all. If you don't know what it looks like 
to bend the knee to Jesus, I would love to talk with you. I'd love to pray with you. We've got prayer partners in the back in the prayer room who would love to talk with you about that. But I would venture to say that there are also some of us who would say that Jesus is Lord of our lives. You say, Jesus is my king. But man, if you're just being honest in your heart of hearts, you know you don't treat him that way. There are sins that you won't let him touch. There are habits that you won't repent of. And, and if you're really being honest, what you would find yourself acknowledging is that Jesus is only king of your life when he plays by your rules. But here's the problem. If Jesus is only king when he does what you want, he's not really king of your life, you are. And man, my prayer for you, if you find yourself there, is that you would today have an honest conversation with the Holy Spirit, one in which you come to him in repentance. You ask him to humble you, to tear down the idols of your heart and to place Jesus on the throne where he belongs. But all of us, just by virtue of being here, have begun a journey, which is the the journey of Holy Week. We've seen the king enter into Jerusalem to claim his kingdom. On Friday, we'll see the king lay down his life for his enemies so that their sins might be forgiven and he might be set free. And my deepest hope is that all of us as a church, those online, those in person, as we walk this journey together, by this time next Sunday, would love our king even more as we celebrate his victory over death on Easter. Would you pray with me? Father in heaven, you are good. Jesus, you are seated on the throne. Forgive us for where we have wanted you to be our king on our terms. Forgive us for where we have not lived lives that honor you. For my friends in this room who don't yet know you, God, I pray that you would work in their hearts now, that you would move them, move them to submit to the authority of Jesus. For those of us who have not honored Christ as Lord, show us grace, bring us to repentance, help us to walk in a way that honors him. And for all of us, as we journey towards Easter Sunday, remind us that no matter how dark Holy Week gets, it always ends in resurrection. And we want to celebrate that. Lord, we thank you for these things. We ask them all in the name of our King Jesus. And we say, Amen. Bay Life, go in peace. We'll see you next week.